still alive is amazing and a miracle because most of the men in his family died in their forties, fifties of heart condition. Gosh. Yeah. He's had nine heart attacks <gasps> and open heart. Wow. I mean, it's all been heart s- stuff, but he's still he's still going you know and he just but it's interesting to be watching this at this time and as an adult you know settled I don't I'm not in my youth anymore so I'm just watching life with this man now you know well you have your mom there so yeah it's a similar thing actually my mom should be 86 in June up until she was 83 she was still driving i I don't know if you have some in America, an MX-5 sports car, a little low sports car, two-seater. And um, and she was playing golf two, three times a week and then going to bowls and then going to her art class. I mean, my sister and I used to say we were orphans. We were golf <laughs> orphans. Um, and then when she had her stroke and, you know, obviously her whole life changed. Uh, she was forced to come and live with me and lose her independence. Mm. But um, it's been very interesting watching the aging process, but also the lust for life. Yeah. Yeah. Keeps yeah. keeps kicking in when you think, oh, they're on their way. And, and then they, they sort of bounce back again. And um, when we lost my sister nearly a year ago, I thought mum would go soon after. And obviously she, you know, naturally she took a, a dive, but she's bounced back yeah. because she wants to live just a little bit longer. Yeah. It's beautiful to watch it, right? It's kind of, yeah. I just, I think about it, you know, cause I do have children and I can't tell you how many times this was the time the baby was coming, you know what I, so it reminds me of that, but just watching it in the aging process as well. Yes. Sometimes that is quite, quite the dance of yeah. moving between these, these worlds. So, well, to me, it, it takes you back to Shakespeare um, in where Jacques is talking about the ages of man, you know, okay. first of all, the mewling and puking, which we know up to the age of four is with the moon and then four to 14, it's Mercury, 14 to 22, it's Venus, blah, de, blah, de, blah. And of course, Shakespeare finishes with the fact that we then return to our childhood state, mewling and puking and, yeah. and being looked after once again. So although she's not mewling and puking, sure. she does need looking after. Yeah. Ah, oh, how brilliant. All right, everybody. Welcome to today's Eat and Greet. And just oh, thanks for some pre pre chat. That is just lovely. But um, welcome, everybody. Hopefully today in this hour, we're going to give you something that's worth the time you took to show up. And I sure think that we will because I know that Hellenistic astrology can get it gets a bad rap for just being dark and moody. You know, there's nothing good over there. It's very scary. We're all going to die right? And that is not actually the case. It would have never survived, I think, if that's all it had to offer. So today, we're just so grateful to welcome Miss Sharon Knight to come and talk to us about some of these angels that, that exist. They're hidden there in um, Hellenistic astrology, but they're, they're there for us to work with, right? They're hidden in plain sight. Oh, those are the best <laughs> ones. <laughs> Those are the best ones. I don't even know what I would do if they weren't hidden in plain sight, you know? And well, so, it, okay. Yeah. I think um, we're so lucky as astrologers to be around at this time. Since, you know, since the 90s with Project Hindsight, with the three robs, of course, which everyone knows about, developing and translating all these materials. And then fortuitously we had two brilliant young men yeah. one learnt at Robert Schmitzney Chris Brennan and the other with Rob Zoller Ben Dykes um, I mean obviously there's other brilliant astrologers who learnt with both of those people but these are the two people that I've had the privilege to actually meet and talk to and um I think in America, you see, you, you never had the same constraints with your astrology because 
the main focus of astrology here, I'm going back to the early 1900s, was the Astrological Lodge of London with Alan Leo and Charles Carter and all those people. And um, what happened here was Alan Leo had a court case and he was imprisoned. And he was imprisoned because he told an undercover policeman that somebody in his family would die. Well, you know, anyone over the age of 40, it's a kind of given that someone in their family is going to die, i.e. an aunt, grandparent. Sure. And although he didn't specify a particular year, the fact that he said somebody in your family is going to die got him imprisoned. Mm. And um, he rewrote all his horror astrology textbooks and removed any predictive matter from it. And then of course, from, from the lodge and from that kind of circle came the faculty of astrology, um, which is one of the oldest schools. And it's a fantastic school. I, I studied with them right up to diploma level. Um, but then this was sort of the 40s, 50s, 60s, and you in America were more open because you had the books of Luke Broughton and you didn't have the same thing with one set of rules. Yeah. Although you had the same Christian dogma, as it were, against astrology, but America, to an outsider, always seemed so much more free and open um, and tolerant of other systems whereas here in the UK it was very narrow and uh, so traditional astrology was done away with it was you know taboo taboo to do tr traditional astrology and even when I started studying traditional astrology in the 80s um, it wasn't accepted mm. yeah. and uh, then we, it, it still wasn't accepted, but with Olivia Barclay having hit the world stage, I through going to America and being so very well received and having brilliant students in those days, such as Lee Lehman, um, who went on to develop the astrology further. I mean, Lee, you know, just has got one of those brains yeah. that <laughs> blows you away. I mean, Good grief. I mean, <laughs> I'd love to have a, an iota of her brain, actually. So, so then astrology, horary astrology, William Lilly, was accepted by the Astrological Lodge, but the faculty, which was the main teaching body, was still very much against anything, the, the word prediction, or even daring to do anything that was traditional because I can remember I might have said it on Michael's podcast that uh, I wrote something sort of with a slightly traditional bent and I had the paper sent back with a red cross saying we do not make predictions um, and so I've always been on the outside and I think I think even today there's only three of us in the UK that I know of, personally know of, that practice purely traditional astrology. So that is just using the seven planets plus mm. notes. And that's um, myself, Barbara Dunn and Sue Ward. So although you've got the world famous Deb Holding, who is at heart a traditional astrologer, but she uses the outer planets. Right. right. So that's, you know, that's the difference. And uh, if you use the outer planets in, in the UK, you're accepted. If you if you just sort of look blankly when people say, "Oh, you're a Pluto in," might be Leo. I think my generation, and I go, "Uh," you're like what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so traditional astrology here in the UK 
isn't met with any um, isn't met with a smile on their face. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Whereas in America, because you you've had such an open attitude and such incredible traditional astrologers, um, it's very it's very much more prevalent. Yeah, and much more accepted. So why, after all this time, why hold tight to it? A very good question. Yeah, why? Well, I will put it down to being stubborn. <laughs> okay. Moon in Taurus. Or possibly the fact that I've always loved history. And I have... Saturn in Sagittarius in the first house. Okay. So there's always been a liking for old things. I mean, my last husband was 20 years and one day older than me. So, um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But it was <laughs> things like I had old cars. I always, I always liked the history of the old cars. I mean, that was partly obviously to do with my well not obviously you didn't know me um but partly to do <laughs> to do with my father my father was a petrol head okay and my very first car when I was 17 was a 1936 Austin Ruby and I had to crank it to start it I went out on my on my 17th birthday and there in the garage was this car and the windscreen opened out it had a sunroof it had silk curtains in the back and you had to double D clutch, which you will not know what that is and be thankful you don't. Um, yeah, so there's always been a love of history throughout my life. Um, and I think it's the history and the philosophy because traditional astrology has a great deal of philosophy, whether it's platonic or stoic, it is there, but very much there in why things happen so yeah it's, yeah and I guess maybe Aries Sun never run with the crowd <laughs> it's a good time though we have we have the nodes in Gemini and Sag right that's the big question right now is well why why do yeah. I do that? why right I have questioned so many things I think over this last year just with the question of well, why do I do that? Or why do I do it that way? And there have been a great number of things that are definite. It's like, yeah, that still fits. And there's been like a whole stockpile that I'm like, oh my God, I've been doing that for the wrong reason for like a decade, you know, but until you're in kind of the prime position to just even think about what you think about, you don't ask it. Yeah. Well, I, 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 again, you know, thinking, Back in the early 90s, I mean, it's entirely down to Olivia because I was tutoring for the QHP. I still am a, a tutor for the QHP and the convener. And Olivia said, if you want to continue tutoring, you have to support this new project coming out of the States. So, I mean, thank God. But I was reading all this material and I couldn't understand it and I had nobody else I could talk to. And this is where I go hallelujah for the internet because... Although yeah. it's, it's had a bit of a bad press at times. But through that, I've met the most wonderful, highly educated, highly intelligent and diverse people that you would never meet because it's, it's all around the world. Absolutely. I mean, there are, I don't know when we would have just run into each other at the local convenience store. We wouldn't. We you wouldn't. Know? And here we, here we are. Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's uh, and I think that what I love so much about our life, our field, is we never stop being interested, and there's always something to talk about. Yeah, yeah, so it does not. The sky does not get boring. It, it never gets boring, and yeah. I'm I'm just studying with Bernadette Brady on her course on on the fixed stars, and uh, it's nice having always looked at the stars to actually think, yeah, actually I do know what that star is. I do know what that star is. Yeah. So, but it's, it's a sheer wonderment of going outside and just looking up. I mean, tonight with the moon so clear and the, well, here in, in Southeast, Southeast England, um, 
it's really cold, you know, great, no heating. Um, but the, the plus point is the beauty of the night sky. That's awesome. It's been interesting because I feel like um, watching during the, the pandemic and as we've moved into 2021, I feel like there was a great call of the people to astrology and a great call of the astrologers to the sky. Because I don't know how many of us as practicing astrologers actually got like sky teachers where we had to go back outside and look, really observe what's going on out there. Have you had that experience? Or well, yeah, you see, again, this is, oh, I am so, I was so lucky with my tutors because part of Rob Zoller's first course was you had to go out, yeah. put a stick in the ground, and watch measure me. the shadows, look at the stars. So that, that was sort of incalculated in me very, very early on in my serious studies. And again, one of my other tutors, Mike Edwards, who sadly departed, I didn't live too far from him in London. And once he realised I was really serious and really keen, um, we would often sit and have a glass of wine, a pint of beer in his case, and just sit and look at the stars and talk, talk stars. Yeah. So I was, I was lucky in that respect. But then in the intervening years from say 2000, I never had anybody to talk the stars with. So although up until three years ago, I lived in a part of the countryside where there was absolutely no light pollution. Mm -hmm. I was six miles from the nearest small town with street lights. So I had beautiful, beautiful skies. Yeah, oh yeah. But no one to talk about it. And now the internet. Exactly. <laughs> so now there's, um, well, there's just so many forums, aren't there? Or, or chat boxes, chat groups. I don't, I don't really know what you call all these things on, on Facebook. But there's, it's, it's wonderful absorbing other people's knowledge and absorbing other people's passions. Even if I have nothing constructive to contribute, I am feeding from their knowledge and their passions. Yeah. And I love it because, you know, one of the things that I notice as I watch online is, okay, we're having an eclipse. Well, I'm telling you about the eclipse in Colorado. Here's what it was looking like in New York and in South Africa. This was our experience. And watching that all happen, I think is, I mean, it appeals to my every mercurial nature, you know, to just... <laughs> gather all of these details and the information and the perspectives and it's just so wild it's so wild how we have access to one another to experience that same sky yeah it it, it is um one of my friends who i have actually met in person um tanya she lives in perugia and uh and she's doing bernadette's Okay. night sky course so it's lovely to be able to share bits with her because we we both know one another's astro language because she's she's also um she's a tutor on the qhp um and she's a highly gifted astrologer so it's it's wonderful going back to the stars but going back to look at the sky with someone with whom you can actually discuss it and not feel like a complete idiot. Yes. Oh my gosh. I know when I first started to really get outside, I was going through with Gemini Brett and he is just his mind. Oh, that man. Oh my God. Wow. Right? And I am highly mercurial. And I was like, Brett, like, I feel so stupid. What are you saying? You're saying so many magical things and I don't know what they are. So it was neat to get to slow down with him and kind of breathe that in. Cause I was like, you are a wealth of sky knowledge and I like need all of it. So slow down. <laughs> yeah. He's, um, he is someone I'd like to meet in the flesh and spend time with. Uh, I mean, his, his knowledge and Bernadette Brady's knowledge, you know, the, the two of them combined yeah. with the actual sky law and, and the astronomy. Yeah, it, it, it is incredible. 
I know. I just, I marvel. And he's so generous with his knowledge, isn't he? He's putting all this stuff out on the internet. Yeah. And he's, um, he has donated to our Kickstarter that I've got going on to come teach astronomy 101 for free. He said, yep, I want people to know. It's wonderful. Just our whole community just is really, it, what's out there is so delicious. It's so just wonderful humans out there for sure. And Lee Lehman is coming actually, I think next month she'll be here. So I will probably be doing more eating than greeting because her mind is just so vast. Well, um, I, was, I was lucky. She, um, she stayed with me one time. Um, I don't know. Well, it must have been more than four years ago because I moved here. Uh, but again, she's she's another one of those. You you say something, and then you have to empty your mind, and you have to be yeah, like okay. this. Okay, hold on. <laughs> because <laughs> there's going to be all these nuggets of information just going blur, blur, blur at you. Yes. Oh my gosh. I know. I know. It's almost funny. I find myself when I watch something that she's doing or anything like that before I met her anyways, I would physically have to get like into position to receive. I'm like, I'm hydrated. I'm well rested. I'm ready, <laughs> you know? And then I, I actually talked to her, you know, to come on the show. And I found that she is wildly funny. And I thought, well, she... what a different experience of, of well, her. But this is it, isn't it? We see, we see the, um, the professional outside working, lecturing. Yes. And, and then when you see them actually away from, from the lecture stand and you have an absolute blast. Right. I mean, she's re she really is funny. She's she, really she is very funny. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, we better talk about our topic. You're just right. Lovely. Yes. You're just lovely. Thank you. So, okay. Back, back not all to, doom and gloom. <laughs> not, not all doom and gloom. Well, again, it, it, it comes down to one, the translations, yep. the material that is available to be translated and then the translators bias you know, unconscious, subconscious, educational, religious bias. Um, so find, finding all these new texts, and, the, and of course there's new translations coming out all the time. There's, uh, I think he's, I just better not say what nationality is, because if I get it wrong, I'll be, I will be killed. Um, but his name's Leventi Laszlo. Mm. And I think he's, Eastern European. That's beautiful. I just love names. But he he has a facility for languages and translations. And some of the translations that he's already doing of this new material is showing that there are subtle differences, but these subtle differences are differences in what has already been translated before. Um, there's a, a very well-known um, his person in the educational establishment who is departed. Um, and Ben has, Ben Dykes has discovered that some of what this chap translated wasn't actually so, but of course it goes against the big educational establishment. So um, things were changed. And we know with the uh, Firmicus, that the James Holden translation of Firmicus was quite different to the previous translation of Firmicus. Anyway, let's look at, look at these angels. But this is the point I want to make. A lot of the reason why the traditional astrology texts are so sharp, abrasive, black and white, is partly the translators, but also, um, I think it was Abu Mashar, he's, his student said to him, why don't you put down everything you know? Um, is it Shadan? Shadan, I think, was Abu Mashar's student. And Abu Mashar reputedly said, well, if I gave you all my knowledge or gave away all my knowledge, no one would come to me because <laughs> they'd have it all. 
Sure. And it's, it's the subtleties. So although you're told um, Mars and Saturn conjoined in Cancer, where they're both in bad condition, actually, Mars has triplicity rulership. Okay, uh-huh. Okay. So he's not, he's actually not so bad. Saturn has some dignity in the terms and not the faces of cancer, but he has terms in cancer. So when Saturn's in those few degrees, he's he's actually on on home ground. And again, I think one of the things is that people say the planets do this, the planets did that, the planet made me do this. Right. But astrology is a symbolic language. Yeah, if you were, and because you were being a jerk. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's all it is. It's a symbolic language. And although we're using the constellations, the shapes of the constellations, the mythology up in the sky, and the planets in the sky, Astrology is a ground-based yeah. symbolic language because where, where on Mars, where on the planet Mars, do we find iron? Mm. But where do we find iron? The symbol for Mars, as we know, is the circle with the thrusting arrow. Well, that's the chemical symbol for iron. Yeah. And it's also the symbol for a, a male of the human species, or I think any species. Um, and who has the most iron in their body? It's men. And then you look at the symbol for yeah. copper. And of course, that's the circle with the cross underneath, cross of matter underneath. And it's the chemical symbol for copper. It's a symbol for Venus. It's a symbol for women. And who has more copper in their bodies? Right. We do brilliant right so it's I it's so. i think it's searching out the subtleties in you have to read it and think think yourself back to their times mm, yeah and in the chat um our people said yes he is eastern european in fact he's hungarian he said oh oh thank you oh gosh well i would i wouldn't have said hungarian you see so it's jolly lucky i didn't actually say <laughs> what i thought yeah so yes but <laughs> great i you see again this is someone who's doing this translation for the love of it he's not um he's not getting paid there's the some obviously it's a minority those of us who are interested in traditional astrology are trying to support him to get these translations done very much as we did with project hindsight but the, as i say the stuff that he's turning out already when you compare it with say some of the pingree translations there is a subtle difference and you can actually see that the yes this man is going to die well, okay, we're all going to die. You know, so back to when you and I were first chatting that Leo got put in prison and Leo was in prison for saying someone in your family is going to die. That, that and taxes, as we all know, <laughs> are the only things we can't avoid. If we're sentient beings, yeah. we will die at some stage. And, um, and since we've had antibiotics and modern medicine and the miraculous, miraculous surgical operations that are carried out we live um they didn't have antibiotics they only had herbs yeah and bleeding bloodletting cupping to to try and save people so death was very much an everyday occurrence and it was it was right there it was in your household yeah. um we're so sanitized against death that we no longer talk about it. And indeed, I have to say, it's one of the things I found rather hard when I was first studying with Rob Zoller was the length of life. And I'm a great believer in the power of the mind for good or ill. And I said to Rob, I really, I just don't want to do this. I don't want to know if I'm going to be a first, second or third differentia 
because I don't want to die. Right. I'm like, <laughs> well, it's not. It, do you feel like it's, it's um, you know, at least in the United States, some one of the things that I think a lot about too, when I hear people talking about their misnomers or lack of love for Hellenistic astrology is that here we don't talk about death the way that we do when you move east, where it is very much so a part of life. And so I know that most of the time when I'm speaking to another American and we kind of get on the subject of death, we, we tap dance a bit more. My clients who are from India, they're like, okay, are they going to die? And it's like, oh, okay, wait, hold on. You said die. <laughs> yeah. you know? It's like, it's a different experience, but do you feel like that that has that, to yes, I, I think I think that's a huge part of it because a lot of the texts are devoted to length of life and dying. You, you look at Valens or Dorotheus, and uh, you know he was killed by a wild beast. He was torn asunder, but wild beast got hold of him. And another one, he would die a horrible death with boiling oil. Yeah, and. Yeah, well, people still get torn asunder, um, mostly by humans these days. Yeah, less often by the wild beast. <laughs> mostly we avoid that a lot more globally. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so one of, one of the basic reasons for looking at length of life and predicting death was to establish dynasties. Yeah. It, it, wasn't the, it wasn't the man in the street that could afford to go to an astrologer. Although having said that, when you look at the, um, out of the CCAG with, oh, the names escape me. Anyway, it's the Greek horoscopes, uh, Newberger and uh, somebody. And one of, well, there's two of my favorite charts in there. One is the slave girl and who stole her linen. And it turned out to be the dirty old, um, head man and the other is the pet lion will this will this pet lion make a good gift for the consul in another country they're, they're two of my favorites and um so the the poor people could go to astrology i mean lily most of lily's work was with the man in the street as opposed to king charles ii and and cromwell and whoever um <laughs> yeah so it you needed to know if you were of the aristocracy here in the uk and i guess most other countries um in europe but you know because when you think italy was a series of kingdoms and france a series of kingdoms and you wanted to go to war or you wanted to try and avert war so you would marry your daughter to the next king's son um, one, two or three son. But then they would want to know, well, is this girl going to live? How long will she live? Because so many women died in childbirth. Right. It's got to, it sounds terrible, but we were really trying to make sure it was worth the investment. It was worth the investment. Yeah. Follow the money. What changes? You know, everything. <laughs> follow the money. Find the woman. Follow the money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, it, it really hasn't, right? Yeah, it's, it's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> <laughs> so when we're looking into, if you're practicing in Hellenistic or you're learning and you're looking for that secret angel, you're looking for the subtle differences, but is there like one thing where, it, where you think, go look at this first? Yeah, absolutely. Sect. Is it a sex. diurnal or not sex? <laughs> you can look there too, but probably <laughs> but, <not> astrology. <laughs> is it a diurnal or nocturnal chart? Everything in traditional astrology is predicated on that simple fact. If someone's born in the day, they will be visible. If someone's born at night, their light will be hidden for a while. I mean, obviously, if there's different... Um, things like such as part of exaltation, then they will become famous. It doesn't mean everyone whose sun is above the horizon is going to be a visible person. Yeah. 
neither does it mean that everyone whose sun is below the horizon is going to be invisible. It's, as I say, all, all the, the Time Lord techniques are predicated on diurnal and nocturnal. The lots or the parts or the Arabic parts, whatever people call them, the majority of them are changed, the formulas changed according to whether it's diurnal or nocturnal, which sect light is in power. So I had a very good chat with my my bestest, bestest collaborator. <laughs> well, actually, I just, I'm just like a sponge with him, Stephen Birchfield. And we were having this discuss discussion about sect and how when the planets are in the right sect or with their right sect light, that they're, they're the party in rulership, the party in power. They become political parties. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a diurnal chart, you want Jupiter and Saturn above the horizon, preferably a masculine signs with the sun. And if you've got a nocturnal chart, you want Venus and Mars below the horizon. And they make up the party, and then Mercury is the go-between between the two parties. He's yeah. the one Mercury who said, refuses to take sides. He's like, I'm here for all of the information. I would love to know everything all of you know. Yeah. <laughs> I have a great respect for Mercury. Yeah, Mer Mercury is the go-between. Yes. Oh my gosh, I will never forget when I started really having the conversation of sect and starting to explore that, um, I was having Chris Brennan over for an eat and greet and we sent each other's charts and he was like, he <laughs> opened my chart and he's like, well, this makes sense. I was like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that sun is right up there. And though my Venus is up there, it's in Aries, you know, it just has worked its light warrior Beautiful queen to be yeah very seen it just was i just will never forget it when he looked he said oh well this makes sense i was like <laughs> does she rise ahead of the sun yes yes you see again that that is so important which yeah. which side of the sun yeah is venus I um, um, venus and mercury and I know, I know from my practice that there are some people, even when you're just talking about the Oriental planet, they're like, well, Venus and Mercury are always somewhere. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I like mine. <laughs> I like Venus as my orienting planet. I'll keep it. Thank you. Well, that, that's what I, she's a warrior queen. Yeah. She's the one who goes out and straps her stuff and says, hey guys, here I am. Yeah, not to mention I have a son in Taurus. Why would I not want my ruling planet to be as fierce and abundant as she can, you know, to go out and take us public? Yeah, yeah. And so that's a nicer use of it. But just if I didn't know some of the tips and tricks of sect and to look other places, or if we don't know, you know, out there. Well, you see, Stormy, sorry to cut across you, but right there is an you, you've just verbalized exactly what people fear about traditional astrology. You've got Venus in Aries mm -hmm. rising ahead of the sun and they go, Oh my God, that's awful. Oh, 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 how can you, how can you live with a Venus in Aries? She's so out of her comfort zone. But yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. She's feisty. She's got spirit. She's going to make her presence felt. Yeah. It's, it's not a negative. It's a negative if a man is looking for a subservient female who's going to walk three paces behind him and say, yes, master, yes, master. A yeah. man would not be comfortable with a woman, with the warrior queen. <laughs> but a real man would say, hey, come to me, baby. You're just what I'm looking for. Yeah. Well, you have to, because I will have already dragged him, <laughs> drug him back to the lair. <laughs> I will have given him time to think about his submission. <laughs> That's brilliant. So right away, though, people can know, go to sect. This, yes. is, this is a treasure. 
yes to consider how it's it's working yeah it if people can only get their head around the fact the sun gives life and everything everything in our universe revolves around the sun we revolve around the sun we know that um and then when the sun's out of sight he's still there and just because the sun is below the horizon doesn't mean he's gone away but it means that the queen, the queen of the night, takes over and she can cast her spells and weave her magic and do girl things that the king really can't be bothered to do. You know, that's, that's girl stuff, like sewing clothes and doing the cooking. Yeah. He leaves, that for, he leaves that for the queen. <laughs> Feelings. We need to do things, right? Yeah. Kind of in that very traditional sense, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so I heard you mention, like, straight off, looking at the terms. Yeah. Is this your next angel in there? Well, again, these give, they give the subtleties to how a planet can be shaped, be changed, be colored. It's, it's, one of the things that you can have somebody born on the same, you know, same day. And if a pla- if say, let's think, let's look, let's look here. Um, so the moon's just gone into cancer today. As we, as we started. And she's in the terms of Mars. Well, Mars is a triplicity ruler of cancer. So he he has a say, he has a share in what goes on in cancer. So this this moon, she's a little bit feistier than you would expect a cancer moon to be. She's going to have a bit of an edge. She's going to be a little bit sharper. Um, But then the next terms that she moves into, so let's just say... even though I've got my glasses on, I can't see what the degrees are. So then she moves into Venus and she becomes very much more a lady. Yeah. It's like, oh. Yeah. So there's there's a calmness. And at the moment, she's in Mars's terms. Where's Mars? Well, he's he's in Taurus. He's not in her terms, but he's in her exaltation. And she's moving to Mars. So there's this extra emphasis right. on a little bit of a spark you know that that moon if this was a child born now that moon's actually going to be a bit of a spark and when the child gets to about eight or nine just using secondary progressors which were known about in traditional astrology and it's sort of hellenistic um that that child's gonna dig its heels in oh yeah there's there's gonna be some you're not gonna move that that child when it gets to about eight or nine yes oh my gosh and it's neat to think about you know to kind of kind of ping pong it a little bit and say this is where this particular planet is at what is the ruling planet of that sign doing and look at the combination that is really available in in the day as a whole you know how much martian energy is actually available in the whole day Oh, this is just lovely. I'm having a moment, Sharon. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> I'm having a little epiphany. So next week when the weeklies are happening and they're four hours long because I have ping-ponged the entire day, <laughs> they'll know why. Yeah, you're looking at that Mars, the Martian energy. So it's, there, there's a lot more, there's, there's a lot of softness actually in traditional astrology, which modern astrologers just go no there isn't no there isn't can't see it can't see it um and it it is things like that all all forms of astrology modern psychological traditional are all aimed at one thing helping the client nothing more nothing less 
it's helping a person find the best route in life for them. And whether you do it in a modern psychological way where the chart is their subconscious feelings about their siblings, about money, about career, or the traditional one where the only part of the chart that really relates to the individual, to the client, is the rising sign, the ruling planet, the sect, the sect lights. Um, everything else is more of a practical yeah. viewpoint of looking at how how your siblings are. Yeah. Mars in the third house. You're probably going to have an interesting relationship with your siblings if you've got Mars in the third. It will be active, likely. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be, yes, there will be confrontation. And of course, depending on what which sign Mars is in in the third, as to how that Martian energy will manifest. Yes. Oh, this is so fascinating, though, to just hear, I think, truly from the position of hearing that people were thinking that Hellenistic was just so cut and dry, but scary, as opposed to looking at Hellenistic as a more fearless way to maybe adventure around the chart as opposed to a fearful way to do that you know yeah, that, that, that's really good yes fearless yeah because it's like guess what all the people will die <laughs> you're yeah. a people but also there's these other things and we can take maybe a little of the gray matter out you know and and find the nuance and simplify the conversation is how i feel like is my interaction with Hellenistic is it, I feel like it, the conversation is simplified a bit. It, it is simple. Yeah. Yes, it, it is simple um, because you're dealing more in everyday reality. When you're dealing with subjective issues, although you can have a good handle on the client in front of you with the astrology and obviously they've come to you they've told you the reasons um but the when you're focusing more on the subconscious mind you can't be perhaps quite so practical in certain specific areas you can be very practical by helping people address their fears address their psychological issues, the, the roadblocks. Um, that's, you know, that's where it comes into its own. Whereas, I guess traditional astrology is a bit more, well, pull your boots up, come on. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a bit more of the Capricornian feel. I have a South node in Capricorn. I'm like, oh, I'm so glad you were born, but do you have a job? You know, it's, like very. <laughs> yeah, it, it, <laughs> is, <laughs> it, it really is a bit more that way. But it's, I, you know, I can really only go, why do, why do the clients that come to me come to me as opposed to a more famous psychological, a famous psychological astrologer. Well, probably apart from the money that a famous psychological astrologer would yeah. charge, um, they come. They come to me because they want practical advice, but given from their perspective, as it were. So, when you, as we were talking, I think before before we started about how my clients are once again because of the lockdown it's all about profession or career mm -hmm. and this is where I think traditional astrology is so good because it's about finding the career that fits not only the body but also the mind and the intellect ultimately what's important in life is trying to make it as happy as it can be for you in this short time that we're here on earth. Yeah. 
And traditional astrology, medieval astrology, was very much about finding the happiness. And I think Ben wrote a book on happiness in the medieval chart, or an article anyway, I think. Yeah, I think he wrote an article. I just would, at this point, as I come to learn more and more about Ben, I am never surprised when somebody says, oh, I think he wrote about that. I'm like, oh, I'm sure. I tell you that. I'm his his output well you can can you see just behind my chair there's this sort of wooden uh -huh. thing that that's a, a bureau and that bookcase goes up quite high and that is full of ben's works that the entire bottom shelf is all ben's works and then i've got other traditional authors and then i've got all my project hindsight stuff in there so yeah. Yeah, I will tell you what I have found over this last uh, year for sure, um, that there are some astrologers that are just like, they just put out content. Like it is a fierce amount of content and output from people. And it's so neat to see because it's just a sharing of the community of the information really, you know, to spark someone. You know, that's even why I eat and greet. I know as we talk, someone's listening and it is churning something for them. And I'm like, great, there's the book, <laughs> go write the book or, you know, just enjoy the chat, whatever it is. But the sharing of information has been amazing in this last year. Well, it's, it, it is wonderful, but what we must remember is of course we stand on the shoulders of everyone who's gone before. So when people try and copyright oh. authors of the 17th century or, or previous I think seriously get a life you know you're not that person either write your own complete book yeah. but don't try and copyright Gabri or Lily or Abu Mishar yes if you've done your work like Ben's books are so clearly and heavily annotated there's so much it's 50% translation and 50% Ben and the same with Chris Brennan's book Every, everyone everyone should have Chris ever, Brennan's does book. anybody not have that book is I guess really <laughs> more of the question at this point I know people who don't even know about Hellenistic astrology and they're like oh I got it <laughs> I have the book saw it pop up somewhere so I bought it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, and another good author, American chap, is um, Joseph Crane. I mean, I, you know, I'm, of course, missing out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of really good traditional authors. Charlie Obert, you've got, you've, Mira, of course, Mira, lovely Mira, um, Dorian. But this is the thing, with the older, and I do mean that nicely, but with, with the older astrologer, they really are happy to share the labours of their work, the years of study. Yeah. Dorian was incredibly generous with sharing her work. We come from delicious lineage. Yeah. I so. now, regardless of the branch, I have found, and I've been doing it a lot less longer than, a lot less time than you have. I have found that this is a beautiful lineage to be a part of with giving people it is not without its quarrels what would you, well, what were people still turns out yes. so you can't people without a good quarrel you know no. <laughs> but for the most part and I really am interested to see what it looks like in this next um, few years really I'm interested to see what Uranus and Taurus by the end of it brings to the astrology community because I just feel like we are we've been unearthing just so much, so much in making it available. So I will be quite interested to see what this community looks like in a couple of years. Yes, yes, I, I will. I mean, obviously I don't do Uranus, although I do acknowledge <laughs> I Uranus. I said the outer planet. <laughs> I do acknowledge Uranus because, um, I just trying to think how Bernard's girls are, 25? 24 so going back about 24 years ago a very very dear friend of mine got married and um and he got married in Sirencester, which is a beautiful beautiful 
village in Gloucestershire, you know, where the royals live. Um, and driving back after the reception, back to Sussex, there's a really high hill on the downs and we stopped for a break. I had another friend with me, astrologer, of course, and we just stopped to stretch our legs and look at the night sky and we saw Uranus. We actually saw the planet Uranus. Yeah. And, and the ancients did know about Uranus because it made a regular appearance, but it, it wasn't a fixed star and it wasn't as visible as Mars or Saturn or Jupiter who, who had a steady predictable cycle against one another. Yeah, Stephen Forrest, he's so funny. He did a talk and he was talking about how um, you can see Uranus with the naked eye. And I, I just remember he did, you know, this is just this wonderful storyteller and he lays it out in the sky and you're just magically in it. And in the end he says, but you kind of have to want it <laughs> to see it. And I thought, oh, well, okay. I will just want it more and go find Uranus out in the night sky. I didn't want it. I know. <laughs> it just made me laugh at the time. And I thought, wait, it was just surrounded in magic. What is that little push? <laughs> How did that come to be? Oh my goodness. It's already been an hour. I can't even. Really? It. Yes. It's a, can you believe this? It goes so fast when you get in with an, another person. I know. I will. Again, thanks to the internet, when I start chatting with Stephen or Tanya or Rod or any, you know, any of my friends who are into traditional stuff, hour and a half, two hours, and you think, hang on, we've, we've only just picked the phone up. I know. <laughs> I and know. That, that's, that's how it feels with you. Well, I just love that. And this has <laughs> just been so delightful. Plus... I think I told you, even when we were, you know, seeing when we were going to set up, I just love your accent. So you could talk about fish and I would be like, Sharon, I'm completely <laughs> in. I co I'm committed to this conversation. <laughs> well, I'm sure glad that you came and we, we got to have a chat and we've got these couple little angels to leave people with. Check out the sect, look at the yeah. terms, yeah, maybe even just soften your heart a bit to Hellenistic. It is it's useful its purpose is to be useful not only is it useful but it is actually the original it's the original <laughs> right where where this all stems from absolutely well sharon if people want to contact you or learn with you or work with you where can they find you they can find me at astrologer sharon or one word .co.uk that's the website and there's details of my course details of the QHP course and details about me brilliant you, email email is the same I'm very simple Facebook astrologer Sharon email astrologer Sharon at aol.com astrologer Sharon.co.uk that's it just keep it, keeping it simple, which is beautiful. And I'll make sure all of that is in the description box um, below this video, you guys. So if you're watching back or you get lost, like I do in the details, you can just find it quite quickly and reach out and maybe become a, a pure Hellenistic astrologer. Well, just an astrologer. Yeah. Just a little, whatever you're going to do. If you want to play just, in astrology, come on out here. Yeah. Just come and be an astrologer. Just come and be an astrologer. I Join us with the stars. I know. I'm like, join the tribe. <laughs> Sometimes I do feel like I do these and I'm like soliciting people to be astrologers, but whatever works, when I hit you where it gets you, you know, Sharon, thank you so much again for, for coming over and you're absolutely welcome back anytime. This is been thank you. wonderful. Well, it's an absolute delight. I mean, I feel, I really do feel like we're just sitting here in front well we are sitting here in front of one another but it feels like we're really close it's it's lovely storm it's really really lovely thank you thank yes. you next time we'll, we'll we'll find something else to talk about so we can do it again because these really are so good so yeah 
thank you everybody as well out there for showing up. Hopefully we gave you something that is worth the time you took to show up. And I look forward to seeing you actually tomorrow because we will eat and greet um, again tomorrow with Nia Boas Flyer. And we are going to look at death charts tomorrow and how we work with those Great. in astrology. I know <laughs> you see there is a method to my madness. I was like, okay, Hellenistic and we'll do the death charts and it'll all be okay. <laughs> We'll see where it goes. All right, you guys, I love you very much. And we'll see you next time. Bye.